we have a, a parsha of all parshas today. Something extremely important that I couldn't just uh, uh, not not you know have a week go by without learning about this. This is something so incredibly important. And in order to do that, we need to just uh, get into a really clear picture as to where we are in the Torah and where we are in the calendar. Because part of today will be a little bit of a review of what we did Shabbos afternoon when we did with the tribute to the Rebbe, to the Lubavitch Rebbe, whose you know, 21st year was this past, uh, was this past Shabbos. Something very, very important. You know, understanding how Moshe Rabbeinu could be Moshe Rabbeinu and not bring us into Eretz Yisrael is something that no person has really been able to understand. There are reasons why Moshe Rabbeinu was left where he was buried, and there are reasons why Dafka had to be through Yeshua. But when you come to Parsha Chukat and you read that God says to them, you will not come into Eretz Yisrael, if part of you doesn't cry at that moment, you're not really alive. You're definitely not really alive with the Torah. Mm-hmm. When you're reading those words, and it doesn't do something to you deep down inside, something's missing. Even if you know the story, and by the way, this is also true about like when you read about Yosef and the brothers, if there's not any part of you that doesn't really stir up your neshama at all, at you know, anything, you're just reading a book. You're just reading, a, and that, it might be a great book. It might even be a holy book. But you're just reading a storybook. These words in this parsha, when Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron are told me very strong words, which we're going to be dis- discussing this morning, Ya'an lo he'emantem bi l'hakdisheni le'enei b'nei Yisrael, l'achen lo taviu et ha'kaal hazeh. He says, Rebona Shleiman says, Behold, you didn't, Ya'an lo he'emantem bi, he says to Moshe and Aaron, you didn't believe enough in me to sanctify me in the eyes of all Israel because you didn't believe in me enough to sanctify me in front of all of Am Yisrael therefore you guys will not be the ones to come and bring Am Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael so I want to discuss today a little bit about what does it mean? What's Eretz Yisrael? And why is Eretz Yisrael here, how Moshe and Aaron suffer so much by not having the schus to bring Am Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael? Because what does it mean that they didn't sanctify God? How do you sanctify Hashem? Lehakdishem. How do you sanctify God? What do you think? How do you sanctify Hashem? Praise Him. Did, they, did Moshe and Aaron praise God? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pretty, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say they're busy praising Hashem. So praising is one level. Might not be Shaykh to Moshe and Aaron. What else do you think? What else do you think is the Hakti Shem? Doing God's will is to sanctify Him. What was God's will when it came to the story of the rock? Talk to it, right? To talk to it as opposed <laughs> to hitting it. Well, I'll ask you a very important question. I'm going to throw out a bunch of questions. Then, we'll... If God wanted Moshe Rabbeinu to just talk to the rock, then why does he tell him, take the staff? Mm. Further, in Shemot, the same thing happens. Am Yisrael is thirsty. And what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu tell Moshe Rabbeinu? Take, the, take a stick and hit the rock. He tells him that. What's the rock called in Shemot? It's called a tsur. What's the rock called in our parsha? Sela. Very interesting. I'm just throwing a bunch of things out there. We're going to see it all afterwards inside. But there's a lot of room here to say, you know, I, like we spoke about last year in Shir, to just say, oh, <clears throat> like, Bible, like Bible critics, which is, are so hard to swallow. This Shabbos, we're discussing the psycho, you know, we're going to do a whole psychological analysis of Moshe Rabbeinu's deficiency in understanding what God really meant. The Rebbe's speak about in this parsha that the truth is, none of us could ever, 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 ever have the chutzpah to be discussing in our drashas, in our shirim, Moshe Rabbeinu's deficiency, right? What a chutzpah, right? Thank you. How, Thank you. <laughs> what's that? Thank you. Yeah. However, 
what's the real, what, what the, the Rebbe say? So what is the point? The point is something very, very special. The book it of, the point is that we are supposed to look at it for some reason because it's written in the Torah. And that's the only reason why I'm looking at it. Not to try and dis- discuss how Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't so good in a certain area. We're looking at it only because it's written in the Torah. And because it's written in the Torah, the Rebbe Hashem wants us to understand something very, very, very important. And in order to understand what happened at what's called May Meriva, which means the waters which caused Meriva, a fight, that's what we're doing on this Shabbos. Now there's a lot of things in this parsha, a lot going on. Miriam dies. Aaron dies. Para Aduma. There's wars. Amalek comes again. There's a shira. There's a song. There's another, you know, there's not just shira tayam. There's the shira, the shira of the be'er, the song of the well. The well plays a really, really important role throughout the whole desert, <coughs> and specifically in this parsha. And like we mentioned so many times, how long does this parsha last for? 38 years. Out of the 40 years in the desert, 38 of them take place in this parsha. There's a lot going on. But without Rabbi Nachman for this Shabbos, don't even try to understand it. Without Rabbi Shlomo teaching Rabbi Nachman, I would say don't even try to understand Rabbi Nachman. But for, for us, what we have today, we have a little piece of text. It's the short text over here. It's not going to be an extra long shir, just a short piece of text which will answer a bunch of the questions we began speaking about right now and will lead us to what we're going to, how we're going to end off as well. So it's just a very, small, it's a very short text and it's based on a, a, a piece in Likutei Ma'aran. It's actually based on a piece we did a few years ago as well. Such a calming feeling whenever you hear that, no? Right. Everyone get? <coughs> now, obviously, we know the, the, I think it's the Rambam. I forget who says it. One of the one of the commentators explained that uh, when they're trying to, do, to figure out what was the aver of Moshe Rabbeinu, what is it exactly that he lacked with? So some say that based on the pshat, he was a ragzan. He had kas. Right? He tried doing what God told him to do and didn't, and he hits it twice. Right? Pamai. What do you wish, when, when, you, when, when things don't usually go for us, when they don't work for us, why is it that our natural instinct is also to hit the rock, whatever, the rock, whatever that rock resembles in our life? Where is it coming from? Why do we think that using force has anything to do with the process? Why is that, why is that Hashem embedded that in our nature? That when we're frustrated, force is the way to go. Now, obviously, I'm speaking here specifically about chinuch of children. I think every single parsha that we're learning has to do exactly with how you raise your children, no matter what age you're at or they're at. But there's something very, very, very beautiful if we could all figure out a way how to attach the words we're learning today to how we are mechanechim our children, even if our children are out of the house, because a parent always wants to be teaching their child in disciplining them even when it's not their place. Even when the kid is... No? Oh. <laughs> even when the kids... Ma- even when they have their own cho- The parent... Even when they're 47. Yeah, a parent can't <laughs> let go of... The, you know, it's the way you're, we're, we're created. You can't let go of the... Oh, so now that you're here, the disciplinary nature in me will stop to show up and appear. Now we'll just be like... Uh, Admiral Pierce, you know, it's always there. It may be kinder to say to teach and guide than discipline. It, it, what it, call it what you want. <laughs> call it what you want, but that's not, it's still there. It's still there very strong. So with all that in mind, let's look right into this beautiful piece. Rabbi Shlomo says like this. Imagine I'm learning something, and I don't understand what I'm learning. Happens all the time. You ever sit? Not just in a shir, but you open up a sefer, you're told, ah, oh, these Torahs are the best Torahs in the world. Or you go to a certain shir and everyone's raving about the person giving over the shir. That poof. And you're sitting there, and for the first tw- 10 minutes, you're like, why did you create me with such a small cup? Why did you, you create me with such a small mic? Everyone here is rolling their eyes, and 
I'm sitting here and I'm cursing the second I decided to choose to come here to learn. I don't understand anything that's going on over here. I'm opening a safer that everyone says the, 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 the secrets of to life are in here. The words, the spirit of this Rav is right here in the safer. And to, for me, I'm garnished. Nothing. Imagine I'm learning something and I don't understand what I'm learning. It happens all the time. The question is, do you keep on thinking about it? But what you're learning and not understanding, what because you want to say, I understood it so well. You know what happens then? Even if you get it, you'll never get it. Okay, it's a very hard paragraph. Shalom is saying over here, you know what the midah of akshanut means in Hebrew? Akshan? Stubbornness. The Nachman says you shouldn't be stubborn about anything. Stubbornness is not a thing that gets you anywhere. Why? Because even if you get it, Rabbi Shlomo says, you don't really get it. There's an element, there's a reason why you don't always understand that which you're trying to understand. When it comes to the wisdom of the world, when it comes to I'm learning, I'm not, we're not talking about right now, when I'm learning the laws of physics, when I'm trying to become a momcha in chemistry, okay? So, uh, I look at these chemists, not that, I do, but I'm saying, like, it could happen. You look at a chemist, like, wow, his wisdom is something I would love to attain. Mechila from chemist, it's never really been my thing, but whatever it is. So if you don't understand something, you just say, okay, I need one more coffee, and I'll be determined to get it. When it comes to Torah, it doesn't work like that. There's a key element you need when it comes to working hard on attaining the wisdom of Torah. What is that key element that needs to appear in your life when things don't add up and when you don't understand something? But what's on an action level? That's not an action level. That's a passive level. Act, there's something you actually have to do. What's it called? No, it's a, it's, everyone's going to feel very, very, very stupid in a few seconds. Me too, because it took me a while to get to this too. When I don't understand something in Talmud Torah, right, and I keep on breaking my head, what am I supposed to do? Ask Hashem to show yes! It to me. I'm what? supposed to ask Hashem to show it to me. But why don't we? Why? What stops us while we're learning something? Because learning is intellect. Learning means, look how give out that, right? It's, it's, it's amazing. You could be so absorbed in the world of Torah. But your ego doesn't allow you to what? Ask the Rebona Shtaylam, can you please help me understand that which I can't understand? It's such a wild thing. You can be so, so to speak, absorbed in the world of Torah, right? But, but when things don't go your way, are you going to hit the rock? It's a very, very deep concept. Parents are given children, and they stand before God, and they're saying to God all the time, Why did you give me these type of children? Or they say, Please, let me know what I have to do and fix in order to be a better parent, to give these kids what they need. This characteristic trait is the sin, this, defi- this separates the, the, I don't know, the shallow from the deep, whatever you want to call it. But having the nobility... We were just talking about that word. I think nobility falls into this very much. Having the nobility, a noble person is one that knows that with all my intelligence, certain things God, God does not reveal to me. And it's by purpose. It's not that I'm stupid and that I don't understand what I'm learning. God had it planned this way. Because God is waiting that while you're learning, you come to the level of, please, Rebona Shleim, you put tefillah into the learning that you're doing. So Reb Shlomo says, when you just stick with that stubbornness and say, I'm going to keep on learning until I understand it so that I could feel like I understand it. So Reb Shlomo says, even if you understand it, guess what? It became info for you. It didn't become Torah's Chaim. It didn't become Torah. It didn't become what Torah is supposed to be. That became like every other subject you learned. But it didn't. It was not at all the way that, you know, the Torah is supposed to be in our lives. Same with children. 
Same with spouses. It's same with every single relationship. There are things, there are walls you're going to run into. There are rocks you're going to try to talk to. It's not going to talk back. Or it won't reveal itself. You'll be stuck. But that you have to realize, are you able at that moment to catch yourself and say, okay, okay, okay. So what, so what do you want now? So what is it supposed to be now? Now let's look back inside. Reb Nachman says that the real explanation of the Torah, the Mefarshei HaTorah, comes from such a deep place where my mind doesn't reach. Ah, this is amazing. Reb Nachman is saying to understand the Torah, it's not even, it doesn't even matter at a certain place, it doesn't even matter how smart you are, what kind of a Talmud Chacham you are, because the real explanation of the words of Torah, the real, real depth of it, come from a place where my mind doesn't reach. Meaning, all the big tzaddikim, at a certain point in their life, with all the learning that they did, and I'm not, we're not knocking the learning, God forbid, we, have, we should be learning much more, I should be learning much more, all the time. But I have to learn with the notion that what? That every tzaddik at a certain point in his life stood before the Rebbe Nishleilam and said, it can't be that you just want to see how smart I could become. You need, you want, you don't need anything, but I'm sure your ratzam, God, is for me to come and ask you something. Like we always say, I said this last week and share how hard it was for me when my Bechorah when Tiferet came home from Gan one day saying brachas before she ever said brachas, and I was so heartbroken that it wasn't me that she came to ask, how do you say a bracha, but her ganenet taught her on her own. You ever see a trait that your child learns? It's beautiful. Certain things you're so happy, your child picks up on. But there's certain things when it comes to the depth of things that you say in your heart, oh, I, w- I, I wish they would have come to me and asked me. I wish they would have asked me. So that's higher than that, 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 that's higher than anything else in the world. Second line in the second paragraph. All I have to ask God, please give it to me as a gift. Meaning that which I don't understand in the learning. Don't say, oh, I don't understand. Look how hard I learned. I must deserve this. Say, no. Please give it to me as a gift, as a matana. And if you ask God on the level of merit water doesn't come out. Meaning, if you ask Rebbe Nishleilam and say, please explain this to me because my father was a tzaddik, or please show me what I'm supposed to be doing in my life because look how good I've been until now. It doesn't work. But if you come to the Rebbe Nishleilam and say, Master of the world, please, 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 give me a matana. Just as a gift, I don't deserve it. Then something else happens. By the way, where do we see that, that this happened with the character in the Torah? that he, at the end he realized that the highest thing to do is to just ask God for a gift. Moshe Rabbeinu asked him to come into Eretz Yisrael. Because what did Moshe Rabbeinu end up doing? Va'et Chanan. We know that means it comes from the words, it comes from the language, Matnat Chinam. That he asked, the tzaddikim say, when eventually he asked God, please let me come into Eretz Yisrael, what did he say? Va'et Chanan, I begged you. But really he said, I'm begging you for a Matnas Chinam. I'm begging you for you to give it to me as an undeserved gift. At a certain point in our lives, with all the wisdom we attained, and all the money that went to tuition, and all the hard work and the money that went to shrinks, and therapists, everything, at a certain point, with all you attained, you have to stand before the King of Kings and say, Yibon Shalaynam, please give it to me just as a gift. And when that takes place, water is meaning. The, the explanation, the Torah we know is like water, everything starts flowing through without even, you, you can't even believe what starts happening. What stops us from asking God for a gift? We've spoken about this a number of times. Why? Well, no, no, but you, you're right. What did she say? Ego, but what, but what, what why? It's yeah. weird. There's a lot of times I've been living that you're just almost too proud to ask for help. Why? What's the reason? No, no, go there. You, you know you don't know. You know you don't know. But what stops you from asking for a gift from a Kaddish What is it? What stops you? That you feel you don't deserve it? You feel, you feel, you feel undeserving? It commits us to... That's what I always connect to. 
that it commits, uh oh, if I asked for a gift, <laughs> exactly, uh oh, then, then I can't, you know, I can't get away with all the stuff I'm usually getting away with. Usually we have this very non personal, personal relationship with God. It's like we do everything, but we don't ask for any favors, anything, because then it has to become really personal. Then I have to really not do, you know, I really have to not do everything that I, that I don't do anymore, right? But really, to ask the Rebbe Nishlam for a gift was part of the way, was the fabric of creation. This is how things were meant to be. So it's a very, very, it's a very important, it's a very important concept. Now look back inside. So Moshe Rabbeinu hit the stone. He wanted to force it. So if you want to get water with power, now again, that means if you want to get the Torah, if you want to understand things about life, if you want to understand Torah with power, you don't get it. Now, how do we know that's true? By the way, the, back in the time of this story of Fukas, did they end up getting water? Yes. Sure. Waters came flowing out. Waters, waters came out. No? Read the, read the Parsha. Did waters come out? They did. But did it do what it was supposed to do? Something was missing. The end result, yeah, waters came out and people stopped being thirsty. But something really, really, really crazy stopped happening. And what's that? Moshe Rabbeinu stops, starts to, so to speak, die. Moshe Rabbeinu starts to die in this parsha. The second he's told he's not coming to Eretz Yisrael, the second Moshe Rabbeinu stops coming in. Look back inside. Again, so Moshe Rabbeinu hit the stone. He wanted to force it. If you want to get water with power, you don't get it. So God says to him, don't hit the stone. Because the flowing of the stone, meaning the exp which is the explanations of the Torah, cannot come by force. Not even from Moshe Rabbeinu, who was holy force. It has to come from Davani, from Rachami, from compassion. Then he says, meaning Reb Nachman, says, Moshe Rabbeinu hit the stone twice. <coughs> Moshe Rabbeinu made a mistake. What were the two mistakes? One mistake is that he wanted to force it. He said, you got to give it to me because I deserve it. Maybe that's what he... As Reb Nachman says, he was saying to the Rebbe Nishtayim, look, look at everything I did, you know, you have to, I deserve it. But you can't. Even Maisha Rabbeinu can't get it by force. So the second thing is that by force means, I want it's it right now. Meaning he was stubborn. There was stubbornness. So now look what he does here. You can ask Hashem for anything. But while you ask you have to say to God, whenever the time is right, give it to me. So therefore, Reb Nachman says, don't force God, just ask. This is a very important, very very deep psychological statement, what he just said right now. In our, in our relationship with the Rebbe Steinem, we think the highest level is to be able to, okay, so I'm going to daven. I don't understand something, so I'm going to daven for it. I don't know why I didn't get something, so great, I learned... <coughs> That by force, nothing will happen. So you know what I'll do? I'll pray for it. I won't say, i got to do it on my own. I'll pray for it. But the highest level is, to, while you're praying, say, there's a pasuk I say in Ashrei. I say it three times a day. And that pasuk is, noten lahem et ochlam be'ito. <coughs> you give each man his sustenance in its time. When, when people need something, that's exactly when you give it to them. That's emunah. Emunah is believing not just that God provides, but that God provides exactly when it's needed. Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. Like, because can you imagine, like, you ask me for something and I say to you, I grant you your wish... And I'll decide when. <coughs> I'll also decide when you get it. <laughs> huh? It's, it can drive a person insane. It can drive a person insane. To be able to really believe that the Rebbe Shalim answers my prayers, but he doesn't answer instantly, it's a tikkun of our door, because we're the door of instant. Everything is right away. Mm -hmm. used to be I waited for months and months and months. Well, 
but you guys it was even more. But I used to wait for months for a certain set to come out, right? So I'd wait, I'd wait, and then I knew it was in the store. I had to find the store that carried the cassette that I wanted. Then I'd go there, I'd get the cassette, and obviously you can't jump tracks when it comes to cassettes. So you have to listen to the whole thing and wait till you saw or fast forward today. When I hear a song that I might like, what do I do? And it's in, I have it immediately. Immediately. Imagine if you found out you knew what you wanted, and you said, Dum. and the iPhone said, we got your request, and we'll give it to you exactly when you need it. <laughs> We're used to that in Israel, though. No. Yeah, in general, it's true. It's true. You call yeah. Bezek. We, we got we, we got your request, and and, and we'll get we'll and get it to you in time. Exactly when you need. Yeah, exactly. When it's a, Sometimes it's a story. Listen, this is a story of Eretz Yisrael. This yes. parsha, you know, this is how things things really do work here much differently. However, how do we know what an exercise it would be? If I want you, and let's do it right now. What's the last thing you dive in for? You have to say. What's the last thing you prayed for? So the first question is, if while you, while you were praying, did you already make alternate plans? If God doesn't answer you? Okay. Or, if, or while you were praying, was it clear to you, your life depends on this? And then while you were praying for what you were praying, were you open to the notion that Hashem could answer you right away? Or Hashem can say, I'm answering you, and I will give it to you in the right time. Or not is, a, or not is a, an area I don't want to go into right now. I can't understand... Like, uh, the Esther Waxman answer. I, I don't want to go there. I'm saying, but things that actually we could feel that maybe they didn't happen right now, but they will happen. First one's very hard. First one's very hard. Huh? It's very hard. What do you mean? Super hard. It's not simple things we're talking about, but this is that's what we're here for. Mama should stretch our, our neshamas as much as we can. So, now we're getting to the meat of what we're learning today. Look at the next paragraph. God says to Moshe, Yan lo emantem bi lahakdisheni. God asks Moshe, Why didn't you make me holy? That's really what God was saying to Moshe Rabbeinu. Again, Ya'an lo hemantem bi, you didn't believe me, lehakdisheni, to make me holy, le'enei kol Yisrael, in the eyes of all Israel. So the way Rabbi Shlomo understands this, God saying to Moshe Rabbeinu, why didn't you make me holy? So Rabbi Nachman says, that holy means if I'm only asking for a gift, like Moshe Rabbeinu. Why didn't you look at me and say, Rabbi Shlomo, can we, it's not, can we just have this as a gift? If you, if, the, if you would have done that, Le'enei Kol Yisrael, Am Yisrael would learn the secret of davening right away. And that would sanctify me more than anything else in the world. Why didn't you make me holy? Why didn't you show everyone, everyone's eyes were on you at that moment? It's not just that you were stubborn. It's that you had a chance here to teach Am Yisrael how to daven. And by the way, Moshe Rabbeinu learns this lesson and ends up telling all of Am Yisrael that he davened 515 prayers for a gift to come into Eretz Yisrael. So we see that Himamish learned the lesson from here, because he ends up doing the exact same thing that God asks him why he didn't do, 515 times, and he tells all of Am Yisrael this in Parshat Vayet Hanan, which is a beautiful way of understanding it. Yeah. Just and seeing how it almost how it, worked. That's a, we'll get to there in Parshat Vayet Hanan, why exactly, why it, why it almost worked and didn't work. Therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't go to Eretz Yisrael because Eretz Yisrael is mamish called holy. And holy means it's only as a gift. And since Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to force it, and couldn't go in. So I'll tell you something very deep. When I'm asking you something on such a deep, compassionate level, without any force, you give, me, you give it to me right away. Meaning when I'm asking you for something, in a very, like you said, with rachman, with compassion, Without any force, I ask you for something, you give me whatever I'm asking right away. But if you tell me you got to do it for me right now, 
then you are, you are already taking it back a little. It's a very hard paragraph. Even if I end up giving you something because you asked it by force, you don't really have it. You don't really have it. The only way you really have something is based on the way which you ask of it. That's what this last piece means. The only way you truly, truly have something in this world is only on, it's not it's something to do with if you have, like for instance, God, give me kids, everyone else has kids. Yeah, you have kids. It happens. Not every person that cried their eyes out to have children and spent sleepless years praying for souls to show up in the form of bodies. Many people that I know never prayed for children, they have children. Some people said, just give me, you know, come on, everyone else. And, and you know, it wasn't really a compassionate prayer. They got children. The thing is, though, how much do you really have that which God gave you? Anything in life. Marriage. Parnasa. Shalom bais. Anything that you have, the extent of how much you have it is based on the manner in which you asked for it. If at all. There are things in life, think of what you have in life right now. What are the things you have in life that you never asked for, but you have it? And think of your relationship to it. Nachon. Nachon. That's that's that Nachon. That's that that's the pshat. But I'm saying something. I think even much more uh, deeper on the level of think of the things that you have. And that you demand, is there anything you have in life because you demand it from God, it has to be. Or maybe now you're unaware of it, but at the time you were stubborn as God knows what and said, you have to give me this right now or else. Those things we usually tend to forget because then we're in the I.O. Then we're in the big, like the big I.O.U.'s gods. Like when it comes to the things that was very mocked that has to happen. That's right. Like one of the reasons maybe that we don't ask because then we're you know we owe you know so if you ask and it happens or maybe even if it doesn't happen we're in a debt and we're being looked at and looked at our davening you know on the uh, Yom Tovi we want to be looked at as like sheep coming in together. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be singled out. Right. Don't give me, don't do something because right. I deserve it or my marriage. I mean, we're scared about yeah. that. I mean, so it's one, I'm not saying reason, it, it's if you go that route, then you're really um, putting yourself, you're making yourself vulnerable. Which is scary as one of the most scariest things in the world. Now, this whole teaching that we did right now is just one way of understanding what happened over here with this sin. One aspect of understanding what's left for us. Moshe Rabbeinu did everything. He did everything. But this one thing that he didn't do remains our tikkun. Moshe Rabbeinu takes the Yidin out of Egypt. We don't have to be worried about that. Moshe Rabbeinu brought the Torah down from Har Sinai. We don't have to be worried about that either. What do you and I still have to be worried about? That which Moshe Rabbeinu was told he can't do. Which is what? The art of going into, to know how to bring people into Eretz Yisrael. That's the thing that you and I are, it's amazing. That's what you and I are still left to do. That one thing that was taken from Moshe Rabbeinu is what you and I are still left to do, to bring Eretz Yisrael as a consciousness to the whole world, to all of Am Yisrael, mm -hmm. to bring everyone in. It's an amazing thing. This gap was left for you and I to continue doing. And in order to understand how to fulfill, how to complete that which was, so to speak, taken from Meishu Rabbeinu, that's why we look at the root of what caused this absence of Meishu Rabbeinu. Which is why we're looking at the sin of this Meimeriva, of what happened over here. And when you look at the Rambam, and you look at Rashi, and you look at Chasan uh, Sofer, uh, Rabbeinu Hananel, they they all give different reasons as to what exactly was the sin. Was it that he hit the rock? 
Was it something that he said? They each, this, was a, this was explaining what happens that you can't do anything by force. That's one element of it. But the bottom line again is, Rebbeinu Shleilam is asking Moshe Rabbeinu, why didn't you make me holy? And that question, why didn't you make me holy? You could still hear that being screamed at us every single day to the spark of Moshe Rabbeinu in each and every one of us. What does it mean to you that God asks you, are you making me holy? Are you making me holy? According to Reb Nachman, what does it mean, are you making me holy? When will you start davening for things? For me. When will you start praying for that which is exactly taken from you? That level that you understand in life, that Torah you learn and understand, when will you just rid yourself of the ego and realize it's never a tacharut, it's never a competition between you and God. God will always be God and you will always be a human being trying to be godly. God's never going to try to be human. It's us trying to be godly all the time. So that's one level of understanding it. But that question of, Ya'an lo'e mantin bi why didn't you make me holy? And I've been thinking so much about this concept of what does it mean to make God holy, to sanctify God, le'enei kol Israel. So this past Shabbos, we had the 21st anniversary of the passing, physically, of the Rebbe. Was there anyone in this last generation that sanctified God, le'enei kol Israel, more than the Rebbe? Probably not. He's one of the figures, it's not just that he was an amazing, a giant in our generation. The truth is, if you take his figure and his impact on the world and put the magnitude of the effect of what he had on the world in any generation, he stands on the giant, he's, he's a giant in every single generation since Adam and Eve. Honestly, there was never such a figure like this. No one ever did what he did. Wow. No way. Wow. Wow. The Rebbe is, uh, the Rebbe is, um, I don't want you guys to take this wrongly, when I say the Rebbe is chai v'kayam, that's going to be a very dangerous thing to say in certain, you know, <laughs> certain areas. But the Rebbe sanctified the Ribbonu Shalem, so to speak, le'enei kol Yisrael, in the eyes of all of Israel. And when learning a little bit about the Rebbe last week, I heard a beautiful thought which we spoke about in Shir uh, on Shabbos afternoon. Yeah, just I'll, there's, there's one point that I'll, I'll say. Mira, you were there, right? I don't think anyone else was there. There was one point that has to do with this parsha that has to do with the hitting of the rock, which I wanted to mention again because it's so important. And it'll, help, it'll help us understand, um, what, what, you know, this this whole notion of what we're dealing with right now. If you had to like, um, I don't know. If you had to like. Um, Say what's what, what? What was the Rebbe's vision? What was the Rebbe's vision? So I think, like in our parsha, Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, "V'dibartan alasela." You talk to the rock, right? That's what we're learning. You talk to the rock. So, like when you naturally see a rock, so what's your instinct? There's nothing there. It's just, it's just a rock. You can't talk to it. Mean, what, what's going to come out of a rock? A rock is a rock. Now, obviously, what are we talking about? We're not talking about people that like walk around there where the construction is and looking at rocks, wondering if anything will come out of it. We're talking about people. People that are rocks. Avanim. People, stones. Mamish stones. The Rebbe believed so much in people, in Yiddish and Hashemas, that are like rocks, that if you learn how to talk to them, v'dibartem ila sela le'enehem, into their eyes, v'natan me'mav they'll be able to give their, their own waters will start to flow. But you have to learn two things, how to talk to them and how to not use your staff. <clears throat> when I learned this beautiful concept, this from Y.Y. Uh, y. Y. Jacobson, it, hit, it, it touched me in the deepest way. I feel like our Rebbe, Rebbe Shlomo, definitely, definitely learned this from the Rebbe because Rebbe Shlomo said, that the Rebbe gave him a new neshama. The Rebbe gave him a new, he said this, when he came from Lakewood to, to Lubavitch, 
the Rebbe gave him a new nisham. And I was always trying to understand what that meant. And um, I think that when we see over here that you know the Rebbe Shlomo could take rocks, mamish, it's, it's still happening today. But even with the Rebbe, it's still happening today. People that are mamish rocks. That on the outside it looks like this. Stone. <laughs> Whatever way you want to look at the parish of stone, yeah? And you see there's nothing there. It, not true. A Yiddish and a Shama don't ever, ever underestimate the inherent depth of a well of Torah, which is in every single Yiddish and Shama. But your job is to look at them in the eyes and learn how to talk to them. And then water will start gushing out. Mamish, non-stop. Gushing out. You know, the Midrash says something amazing. The Midrash says that Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem told God, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, listen, go to the rock and start to talk to it. What do you mean talk to it? What were you supposed to talk to it? He said, the major says, start saying Torah that you learned at Har Sinai. Start giving over Torah. Lishanot perex. Say in Mishnah. Say something you learned at Matan Torah. Start teaching Torah in front of a rock. And then they'll see that water will start flowing out from the rock. Why? Because the whole purpose of Matan Torah was that you can change over any rock in the world. You can change. The nature changes at any given moment any given moment with the power of Torah. What happened at Matan Torah? It says that it started raining, it was sunny, everything, everything, everything switched over. That wasn't meant to be only to happen only there at, Mat at Har Sinai. That was meant to be always, that it's that power of changing nature in the schus of the Torah can happen all the time. And that maybe, maybe now we can understand what it means that when Moshe Rabbeinu was told by God, you didn't sanctify me in front of all of Am Yisrael, sanctifying me in front of all of Israel would show that my word, teaching Torah, can change over nature at any given moment, all the time. The Shekhinah comes at any time you share words of Torah. It doesn't matter where you are. It wasn't just at Mount Sinai. In fact, we know that there is no sanctity anymore at Mount Sinai. That was a one-time thing came down that one time. Then it was for you to take it with you wherever you go. But the power to crack open rocks and for water to come out, that's an amazing, amazing way of looking at the world and choosing. I'm going to look at anything in my life that looks like a stone, that looks like it's a rock. And if I believe in the power of Torah and that the Rebona Shleilam gave me the power of speech, I can change anything. I can crack open anyone's heart. This is what the Rebbe believed in. You know, so now you'll ask a very good question, but wait a second. We learned in Shmot that when Am Yisrael was thirsty, God told Moshe Rabbeinu to hit the rock. So what is it? Do you hit the rock or do you talk to a rock? What did we say before? There are two different words for rock in Hebrew that we, that we, that are learned, we used in the Torah. Tzur and Selah. A tzur is a rock that really doesn't have anything in the inside or in the outside. It's all hard. It's all very, um, it's all very, uh, it's concrete on the outside and in the middle. So over there by tzur, the Torah uses the word tzur in Shemot to hit the tzur because when certain things, that nothing, there's nothing inside it, by there, Moshe Rabbeinu was told, hit it and I'll make a miracle out of it. Out of nothing will come something. Sela is something else. And this is what we learned in the Shabbos share. The Sela that's used over here, there's water in it. Now, can I give, can I just get a pen for a second? Oh, you did it already? Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to show the Chevra online. You see how, uh, actually, it's going to come out. Hmm, they, yeah, they won't, they won't. They won't see it. Well, I'll just put it up for a second if you can just imagine. And I want you all to look at it. This is a certain technique we have. When you take the word Sela and you spell out each letter, how do you spell out the letter Samech? Samech. Remember, we did this another time. How do we spell out the letter Samech? Samech, Mem, Chaf. Then Lamed, Lamed, Mem, Dalid. Then what? Ein, Yud, Nun. What letters come out in the middle from within the Sela? Mem, Mem, and Yud. What does that spell out? Mine. 
Do you see? Where else did we do this technique? It says in Parashat Baalotcha, Kach et haleviim mitoch b'nei Yisrael. The levies are the heart of Am Yisrael. They're the inside of Am Yisrael. You take them from within Am Yisrael. Take the word Yisrael. <coughs> spell out Yud, Yud Vav Dalid. Sin, Sin, Yud, Nun. Resh, Resh, Yud, Shin. Aleph, Aleph, Lamed, Pei. Lamed, Lamed, Mem, Dalid. The inside of those letters also form the word Levim. When you spell out the word Yisrael, the inside is Levim. When you spell out the word Sela, the inside is Mine. You know what the hardest thing in... Huh? No, it, it would be, but... <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> but, not, not, but this is the... Like, this, this, this is what I want to get to in this year. This is the Rebbe's, the Rebbe, the Rebbe's legacy. This is what it is, is that... What's left for us, the one thing that Moshe Rabbeinu had to do, this is what God wanted him to do. God <laughs> wanted him to do this and leave this job for us. What job is left for us to do that Moshe Rabbeinu left for us to do in this world? Learn how to talk to what seems to you like a rock. Don't only learn how to talk to a rock. Believe that within a rock, wellsprings of water are waiting to start pouring through. They're just waiting for one person to address it. That's what's left for us. That's Parshat Chukat. That's the whole story over here. That's the legacy of all the great tzaddikim, and it's definitely, most definitely, the legacy of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So, Alavai, we should have the schut to not just be able to give away this Torah to other people, but that in life, when there's stones in front of us, whether it's people or whether we look in the mirror, that happens sometimes as well. And all you see is mamish nothing. Stone, a rock. How much do you believe at that moment when you feel there's nothing even in you that there's a wellspring of water of Torah waiting to gush out? Look into your own eyes. Look into your own eyes. Learn how to talk to yourself. Spotters, learn how to talk to yourself. Learn how to reach the inner place within you and don't be too shocked afterwards when all the Torah starts gushing out. I have to tell you, I've seen this with people. Certain people, nothing could reach them. Nothing. No one. Why? Force. Force. They met the right person to talk to them in their eyes. Le'enehem. You, 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 you can't believe it's the same person. Suddenly, wellsprings of Chidush Torahs that are flowing out of the person. Chesed, love, kindness, compassion becomes the person's motto. Don't be too shocked. This is how the Rebbe created created us Eden, Am Yisrael. So alavai, 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 we should complete this job of learning, the, mastering how to talk to a rock, because we'll see a lot of rocks in our life all the time. And Bezrat Hashem, all the Ma'ayinotecha, all the wellsprings, Yafutzu will be will be just flowing out all over the whole world. And all of Am Yisrael will learn that this is the secret of Eretz Yisrael too. Here, as we've seen already, nothing comes with stubbornness. Lahefech. When you're stubborn here, you're just waiting online for another few hours for Bezek. It doesn't, doesn't help. Stubbornness doesn't help over here. I have a friend, beautiful hippie guy, gets on the phone with like Bezek or Banks, and he's like, and he starts like, you know, Shalom Zotosnat. Achoti, mashlomech. He starts talking to sister, how are you? No, who talks to him like that? And I'm always like, oh my God, they're going to hang up on him in a second. Never. Never. It's always like, I'm not just an operator. Someone's talking to like, him, someone's talking to my eyes. And the service actually happens like that. Mm -hmm. We just can't believe it. And don't worry, you don't owe the person anything afterwards. They're getting paid to serve you, right? You don't owe it, but with their lonish leilam, Ay, Alavai, it's a different ball game. You don't owe him anything. What, 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 owing, you don't owe the ball. How can you owe infinity? <coughs> How can you owe eternity? Just be thankful for the fact that we have the skills to talk people in their eyes. And Bezrat Hashem, everything should feel like an absolute gift. Because when that happens, the appreciation and the meaning you have in life surpasses anything, anything in the world.